Good morning guys, Tony Maritato here, physical therapist, and in this video we're going to take a look at WebMD and we're going to see how they explain what a rotator cuff tear is. And I'm going to bring my kind of two cents to the situation from a physical therapist perspective. As an outpatient orthopedic specialist, I focus my entire practice on treating post-surgical rotator cuff repair cases because I think that it's one of the most fascinating situations and I think that I bring a new perspective to the recovery process. But let's jump into the screen. Let's take a look at WebMD and let's let's learn a little bit about rotator cuff tears. So if you go to the WebMD website and I'll post the link below this description, you'll find a video. It's a great video. I'm not going to share it now, but go ahead and watch the video. So essentially WebMD starts by explaining what exactly a rotator cuff tear is. Now, the rotator cuff is made up primarily of four muscles along with the tendons. The tendon attaches the muscle to the bone. The most common scenario for a rotator cuff tear is the supraspinatus tendon gets torn. And so the supraspinatus tendon, if you see me down here in the bottom corner, it runs along the top of the shoulder blade, comes un underneath this bony ridge, which is the acromion process. It attaches out here on the upper arm bone, which is your humerus. And it's primarily responsible for pulling the humerus down as you go to flex the shoulder. So when I go to reach up, that supraspinatus muscle and associated tendon will kind of pull the humeral head down as the shoulder, the arm rotates up into the overhead position. So that is the most common, but certainly you could have tears in the subscapularis, the infraspinatus, and the teres minor. Um, quite often when somebody has a rotator cuff tear in one or more of the tendons, they might also have problems in the front of the shoulder, which is the long head of the biceps tendon. So those are all extremely common when it comes to shoulder pathology. WebMD talks about the symptoms associated with rotator cuff tear and from their perspective, individuals have, they call it trouble raising your arm. I'm going to say that it's painful to raise your arm with, with a complete rupture or tear. Um, usually you can still go through the movement, it's just painful. Now if you have multiple tendons that are ruptured, you might not even be able to raise the arm. And I can tell you from clinical experience, when somebody comes in with problems of the rotator cuff, where if you see me with no shoulder problems, I raise my arm straight up, straight down. Most of my clients pre-surgery will tend to chicken wing, meaning they'll, they'll raise the elbow, trying to lift the arm simply because they don't have the control of that humeral head to allow the shoulder to move and function properly. Um, another situation is you will feel pain when you move your arm in certain positions or you lie on your arm sleeping at night starts to become a challenge you wake up because of pain throbbing aching in the shoulder you have weakness which we already mentioned in the shoulder you're unable to lift or carry things the way you normally would you hear clicking or popping now I'm going to tell you the clicking and popping and I'll probably record a whole dedicated video to that there is different kinds of clicking and popping Clicking and popping is not indicative of a tear. It could be just simply a tendon or ligament clicking or popping over a bump on a bone. It could be a piece of cartilage deep inside the socket. It could be a labral tear. The most common complaint with labral tears is what, what I would describe as a clunk or a click or a pop. When you go to move the arm kind of over and across the body, um, but I don't want you to get too hung up on these symptoms. You know, in my clinical experience, typically when somebody has a supraspinatus tear, they experience pain down the outside of the shoulder and in the posterior third of the shoulder. When somebody is dealing with a biceps problem, they experience pain down the front or the inside of the front of the arm. Certainly you can have pain in multiple areas. Sometimes the pain will radiate down as low as into the outside elbow but those are signs and symptoms that are consistent with what we would expect for somebody who has a rotator cuff tear or some sort of pathology. Now when we look at the tear causes or the risk factors, 
So, you know, occupation is listed as a cause or a risk factor, lack of blood supply. Certainly as we get older and we're not as active, the muscles become thinner, they become weaker, our circulatory system is impaired. The, the healthier you can stay, the more fit you can become, working on your cardiovascular fitness will absolutely help stem some of the damage that happens with inactivity. Um, bone spurs, so this is essentially where that bony ridge on top of your shoulder, you start to get a little bit of a bony bump or a bone spur that grows on the bottom and it could pinch or impinge on the musculature below it. Um, you know, they list age as a factor. I know plenty of 20 year olds who have rotator cuff tears and I know plenty of 90 year olds who don't. So I would not list age. Family history questionable on how much that's going to influence rotator cuff tear. Athletics, I mean, athletics and occupation, I'm human too. I love to find a reason to blame, you know, an injury. But the reality is the benefits of athletics usually far outweigh the detrimental effects to the body. So if I had to choose, I would be more athletic, more active, more physically fit, and experience a rotator cuff there, tear than to be sedentary, not do things for fear of damage, and still end up with a rotator cuff tear. Just food for thought, but that's a, a therapist's perspective. Um, rotator cuff tear diagnosis. So probably the most common would be an MRI. And what the surgeon is looking for in the MRI is obviously signs of damage and tears. X-ray will show the bony anatomy, so if there are bone spurs or other factors that are going to impinge on the rotator cuff, the X-ray will reveal the bony anatomy. And occasionally um, they'll use an ultrasound so they can see in real time what the tissue looks like, how it's moving, and, and sometimes a skilled clinician can use an imaging ultrasound to find the rotator cuff tear. Um, Rotator cuff tear complications, you know, so certainly a rotator cuff tear may go untreated if you are able to tolerate the discomfort and function within your daily activities. Um, a rotator cuff tear, unless it is, um, I'm trying to figure out the right word for it, it's rarely a threatening condition. Yes, absolutely, it's frustrating. Yes, absolutely, patients will report, you know, dropping things and not being able to function the way they want. But if your tear is manageable and you want to put in three, six, 12 months of dedicated rehab, either on your own or with the skills of a physical therapist, absolutely, you have the time to do that. Um, occasionally your surgeon might say this is a repair we need to get changed or fixed right now but typically if you talk to your surgeon they're going to look for a conservative approach and that conservative approach would be a combination of physical therapy maybe seeing an occupational therapist to modify the way you're doing certain things working on your strength your endurance improving your vascular system you know doing all the groundwork to give the shoulder the best opportunity for recovery. Not every tear is gonna heal, but the pain might go away and the function might improve without surgery. We certainly don't have a definitive answer on when is the perfect time to have a rotator cuff tear repaired, but you know that's a discussion for you, your family, your support system, and of course your surgeon. So let's see what else WebMD has for us. So talking about treatment, certainly there is a surgical repair uh, that's available. Certainly there's conservative treatment which involves medications, anti-inflammatories, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, um, just plain old pain management, rest, active recovery. Uh, you may get some exercises to do at home. I absolutely recommend you see a physical therapist for those exercises, rest to allow the rotator cuff to heal, but rest is not inactivity. We like to say active recovery, active rest. You're still using the shoulder, you're still moving the joint, you're doing things to prevent the deterioration of the shoulder because remember, 
Maybe you have one out of four muscles that's torn, but you also have the whole rest of that part of your body. You have an elbow and a wrist and fingers. You have a neck. All of those things require consistent movement and activity to stay healthy. So don't sacrifice 40% of your body to try and repair a single torn muscle. Find balance. Find a professional who can help you. And then, of course, from a surgical perspective, there's an arthroscopic procedure where they poke the little holes in the shoulder and they go in there with the camera and the tools and they do the surgical repair. There's an open procedure where they actually make an incision, expose more of the tissue. Typically, a surgeon will make the smallest possible incision that will allow that surgeon to do the job to the best of their ability. We have a mini open, so it's kind of an in-between between a full-on arthroscopic versus a full-on open incision. There's tendon transfers, and of course, there's a shoulder replacement. The shoulder replacement is a completely separate procedure than a rotator cuff repair, so maybe I have time, I'll do a new video on shoulder replacements. But let's take about look at the outlook and what we can expect from a rotator cuff repair um, rehab process after surgery. So for most of the patients that I see here in the Ohio area, I see some patients literally the day after rotator cuff repair surgery. Patients are not allowed to drive. They're in a sling with a little abduction pillow underneath them. They're typically going to be in the sling for four to six weeks. They're not allowed to use that shoulder for four to six weeks. And the, the, my job as the physical therapist is to assess progress, make sure I don't see any problems with the healing, make sure I don't see any signs of infections or any complications with the incisions, to initiate the passive range of motion because the patient's not allowed to actively move their shoulder on their own, to teach compensatory strategies and exercises for the rest of the body, and to bring peace of mind to you, the individual patient. Because there, I've seen hundreds of rotator cuff repairs over the, the course of almost a 15 year career now, whereas you've only seen yours and maybe you've had one or two family members that have had it done. So I bring the experience of several hundred other patients before me and other clinicians that I've spoken to, to answer your questions, bring you that peace of mind and let you know, hey, this is totally normal. Yes, it's frustrating because you can't get comfortable to sleep at night. Yes, most patients after a rotator cuff repair will sleep in a recliner for two to four weeks. Yes, the hand, you know, you might get numbness, tingling, swelling in the hand because you're not moving it around. Like there are a lot of common scenarios that are questions that we answer repeatedly because it's new to you, although it's not new to us. So I really encourage you to connect with an amazing physical therapist in your area should you have surgery. And then finally, let's talk a little bit about prevention. You know, as a physical therapist, my ultimate goal is to bring you the best advice possible. I would recommend you do a Google search on PubMed, P-U-B-M-E-D, and you look at some of the studies that look at conservative management of rotator cuff repair, and you look at some of the studies that compare a sham surgery to the actual surgery. Now, a sham surgery is when the patient doesn't actually have surgery they think they had surgery, they're told they have surgery, they, usually they'll do the little incisions in the skin, but they don't actually go into the shoulder joint, they don't do the repair, and they compare the outcome of patients who have had a sham surgery to an actual surgery, and I think you're gonna find that the results are pretty remarkable. If you wanna see me review some of those studies, let me know in the comments below, but I can tell you that from a prevention perspective, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. I think that's the saying. Get out and be active. Move the shoulder, use the shoulder. If you have severe osteoarthritis and it's painful to, to move the shoulder through most of the traditional exercises, connect with a physical therapist. They'll teach you some simple exercises that you can do in a pain-free range that keep the rotator cuff healthy, that keep the circulation and removal of the waste products, strengthen the immune system. You know, there are so many other ways to approach helping the shoulder, even with a tear, that might not even include shoulder exercises. 
Sometimes exercises we do in other parts of the body can have a significant benefit to the way the shoulder feels. So that was a great article. Web, WebMD, thank you so much for posting that information. And if you have more questions specific to shoulder pathology, shoulder pain, anything related to the shoulder, go ahead and post your questions in the YouTube comments below. I'll do my best to get to your questions, produce videos specifically for your questions. And my hope is that I can bring a little bit of education, a little bit of peace of mind to you sitting at home so that you fully understand what's going on. Guys, as always, I appreciate your time. Like the video, subscribe to the channel. I'll catch you on the next one.